I've often referred to my work studying Matthew Franklin Whittier's life and work and also the life and work of his soulmate, Abby Ployan, as a tapestry. And there's a reason for that. Um, if you study the life of any real person, it's a tapestry because everybody's life is a very complex tapestry. If you arbitrarily attempt to force the round peg into the square hole, as people assume I must be doing, then it's not a tapestry like that. It only has about that much thickness. You know, you go beneath that little surface layer and suddenly things don't line up and don't match up and don't make sense. If you're studying the life of a real person, everything connects. This thing over here connects with this thing down over here. The obscure pieces that Matthew wrote tie in with the famous ones that he wrote. There's, you know, all kinds of interconnections. Well, that theme of a tapestry is something we're going to delve into today. And the way I got started, rather appropriately, was this book called The Partentonian Patchwork by Benjamin Penhallow Shillaber, published initially in 1873. Apparently the history of this thing is that uh, there was a big fire in Boston and they lost almost, you know, like all of their stock and had to reprint it and so on. Um this contains quite a bit of work by Matthew Franklin Whittier. And uh, the way that I got into this yesterday was because I was drawn yet again to an epic humorous poem called, let's see, the poem itself is called The Modern Syntax, Dr. Spooner in Search of the Delectable. And it has one of Matthew Franklin Whittier's typical uh, fall biographies and kind of philosophical introductions that um, introduces it. And it launches into this long, long poem. The gist of the poem is it's kind of a metaphor for finding the truth or finding happiness in life or the different avenues that people pursue trying to find that unnameable unquantifiable thing that they're looking for. Uh, so it has two levels. It's a, it's a silly poem, you know, on the surface, but it has a much deeper import. This was not written by Benjamin Penhallow Shillaber. This is, it's got Matthew Franklin Whittier all over it. And again, I know that because I've studied over 2,300 of Matthew's works, which I have digitized and which database is searchable for what it's worth. But this is an intuitive thing. I know his style. First off, I know it because I remember it. it, you know, viscerally, intuitively, I remember it, having the same higher mind as he did. But uh, I also recognize it from having studied so much of his work. So today I'm not going to try to prove anything to anyone because this kind of thing there's not really a smoking gun per se that I know of. Now, I'm, I'm reading this whole thing from top to bottom now. I haven't finished it yet. There could be some smoking guns in it that definitely point to Matthew's authorship. Um, <coughs> but this is the kind of thing that I know because of a million connections in the tapestry, you know. Well, I'm just going to kind of dip into it and give you an idea of how all this stuff is interconnected. And then at the end, we'll delve directly into this particular poem. Uh, let's see. Hold on a minute. I left my Kindle charging. I'll be right back. Now, um, Benjamin Penhallow Shillaber was famous for one character and a few related characters, and that was Mrs. Partington. There actually was a Mrs. Partington. He didn't actually originate that character. He kind of commented on the character, and then his commentary became famous, and he became a, attached to and associated with this name and this character, Mrs. Partington. Mrs. Partington was a daft old lady who got everything wrong. You know, she would make malapropisms. So she was basically Mrs. Malaprop, but a slightly more modern one. And she was well-written, was kind of, they were mostly anecdotes, I would have to say. You know, the short stories, anecdotes. Shillaber was also a good poet. 
He was the editor of the carpet bag, which Matthew was intimately involved with, as we'll see in a minute. But he and Matthew collaborated, and Matthew kind of was the man behind the scenes. Matthew was actually by far Schillaber's senior as a literary figure. Matthew had done characters like uh, Mrs. Partington many years earlier. So that's the first thing we're going to do. We're going to go to the New York Constellation of April 16, 1831. At this time, Matthew was editing this paper. And in a minute, I'm going to show you how I've concluded that. Um, it's not speculation. I'm absolutely certain of it. And again, I can't prove anything to skeptics today. That's not my point because I mean, you have to be willing to look at the evidence, and then you have to be willing to take time to look at the evidence, and you have to be open-minded. I can't crack open anybody's skull with this kind of evidence, you know, <laughs> and force them, you know, to, to beg my forgiveness, you know, and all that. I mean, that's, that's not going to happen with this kind of cumulative evidence. Now, um, this is called Mrs. Huckabuck's Letter on Phrenology. You may know that phrenology was the science of studying the various protuberances protuberances on uh, people's skulls to determine their character. There is some truth to this. Everybody knows it. You look at uh, people's countenances and you can see far beyond chance some kind of connection to their character, you know. Uh, but exactly what it is is very difficult to determine. They tried to make a science out of it and they failed miserably. I think that's because they didn't take reincarnation into account. I think what you're talking about is the, the physical appearance reflects hundreds of lifetimes, you know, things that used to be attitudes and values and worldviews, eventually, a hundred lifetimes down the road, or however many it takes, come from the inner core of the person and work their way out and end up on the face. So very difficult to, unless you could nail down all the past lives, You'd have a heck of a time correlating that with physical features, and yet there's some truth to it. There's there's usually some truth to everything. The question is how much truth, you know. Anyway, this is Matthew writing as a Mrs. Partington-like character in 1831. Now, this poem, this book is 1873, but it probably was written quite a bit earlier because Schillaber seems to have taken material that was written in the 50s, say, after the carpet bag, and eventually published it in book form like 20 years later. So there's no way of knowing when that material in that book was actually written. But let's say this precedes it by at least 20 years. This precedes Mrs. Partington, I can't remember when that was started, 47, I think, something like that, that Benjamin Penhallow Schillaber began writing Mrs. Partington. Well, this is 31, so it's like 15 years before. It's written in the style of Joe Strickland. When Matthew was 13, he started writing a character named Joe Strickland, and that was a runaway from the country who ran away to the big city, which he was. So it was basically autobiographical, except he supposedly came from, from Vermont instead of from Massachusetts. Obviously, he was hiding his identity. Uh, but it's full of not only dialect, Yankee dialect, but horrible misspellings and meaningful misspellings. See, these are malapropisms. These are Freudian slips, intentional Freudian slips for his character. And I'm going to try to give an idea of this. I'm a firm believer in the doctrine of free knowledge. That's the first sentence. Well, right there, he's not a firm believer. He's a farm believer. So he's a rural, or she rather, is a rural character, okay? In the doctrine, there's a third one, in the doctrine of free knowledge. Well, not doctrine, doctoring, okay? A free knowledge, which means it's free and it's null. Okay, so he's a skeptic. See, Matthew is writing as a skeptic, and I'm, I've told you before, he was very much a skeptic in these early years. So we've already got three misspellings, which are deliberate malapropisms in the first sentence. I'm a firm believer in the doctrine of free knowledge. <laughs> then he goes on, or she, well, she goes on, the character. I've been reading books and here in lectures on that subject, and I'll have to put it up on the screen so you can see the misspellings. 
And I say it's not to be introverted. What word is he trying to say? I can't think of it. So I bet you've got it. I can't think of it. Anyway, folks may laugh as much as they please, but that's neither here nor there. I say the doctrine of free knowledge is not to be introverted. I've been studying my own head, not studying, studying my own head before the looking glass, and I'm convinced there's something in it. The noggins on my cranicum, thus I say it myself, are astonishingly developed, as in stonishly, and where there's so much fire, you know, there must be a little smoke. Little was one of Matthew's trademark misspellings. As the old maxim says, it can't be all falderall. Now, as to the noggins of my own head, I haven't quite so good an opportunity to examine them as another person, parson, as another parson. But I'm peculiarly struck with my noggins of intellectuality, which you know, being on the front part of the forehead, are most cognizable to the visual sight. For instance, there is the noggin of locality and the noggin of calculation. They're amazingly developed. So that gives you some idea of Matthew writing a Mrs. Partington type character in his trademark Yankee misspellings as Joe Strickland. Let's look at this particular edition of the uh, April 16, 1831 edition of the New York uh, Constellation. So I've got it up here on the screen. This is the editorial page, which is to say where some people call it the masthead, but where we have the name of the paper and the editor, who is Asa Green, and then the date and place of publication. Typically, an editorial comes right under that. The editor, that's the editor's opportunity to write his editorial in the usual newspaper. But Matthew is running this newspaper, I would say, exclusively at this point. By 1831, Asa Green is running his bookstore, and Matthew, who in April of 1831 is, what, 18 years old, he's running the newspaper. This entire page is all Matthew. I don't say that he necessarily wrote all of it. He definitely, I would say, chose everything on this editorial page. And this is why I say he was editing. It's not just a fond imagination on my part that, oh, I want to make Matthew important, so I'm going to say that he edited this paper. No. Okay, so I know his style. Here we have, right under where there should be an editorial, there's a kind of an editorial on Hog Reeves. Well, that's definitely Matthew's work. I mean, I know... I know him. I know that he has many times made fun of hog reeves. A hog reeve was an official, but the lowest kind of official you can imagine, the most cartoonish kind of official you can imagine. In a small town, someone would be appointed to be in charge of the stray hogs, keeping the stray hogs out of people's gardens and things like that and getting them penned back up again and prevailing upon the farmers to pen up their hogs and so on. See, that's a hog reeve. Well, that really amused Matthew. I can't read this. It's too small here but um, in the Kindle. But he has a little poem that he opens up with, and he attributes that poem to Old Ballad. So that was another one of Matthew's little funny tricks. Now, the one underneath that is Crib Biting. It's, I think it's a British story about a, uh, a dispute in the courts about a horse that uh, this fellow sold that he knew was a crib biter. I imagine Matthew picked that up somewhere. Here we have, um, he's been reading Williams Register, and it has statistics of the number of uh, people following different professions in the state and in the city of New York. And he says that there are so many physicians in the state and in the city of New York. And then there are so many uh, clergy, and then there's so many lawyers. So uh, the stats are kind of interesting, but the gist of it is that the physicians kill people, the clergy comes in to say the last rites, and then the lawyers take over. <laughs> that's, the, that's the inference there. Immediately after that is a poem called The Elbow Chair. And trust me, Matthew wrote that poem. It's a humorous tribute to his comfortable elbow chair. Uh, that's his style. And, and then comes Mrs. Huckabuck's letter. 
which I just read you, Harrietta Huckabuck. And there's something about tickling trout. The last thing on the page is a, is a silly little article about uh, catching trout by tickling them, which would have amused Matthew. That whole page is his. He is the de facto editor of the New York Constellation as a teenager, as a boy. And he would help his brother, John Greenleaf Whittier, get exposure by taking John Greenleaf Whittier's poetry, which had been published in the local Haverhill Gazette or whatever it was, or Essex Gazette, and reprint it in New York City where he would get exposure. So the whole thing is reversed. Matthew Franklin Whittier was helping to build John Greenleaf Whittier's career. This is blasphemy, you know. <laughs> I, I don't know what to say. All right. So let's see. Where do I want to go next with this? This piece that I'm going to show you, ultimately, the uh, poem about finding the delectable. Dr. Spooner is in search of the delectable, you know. Well, Matthew would often take ideas that he particularly appreciated and revisit them maybe 5, 10, 15 years later. Now, we don't know when this poem about Dr. Spooner was actually written, but he's done something similar in June of 1848. Matthew was writing when he was undercover as an abolitionist during the summers of 1846, immediately after he left the New York Tribune, where he had been writing as his accustomed star, which historians have mistakenly thought was Margaret Fuller. When he left that paper, he came to New Orleans in 1846 and began writing under his initial, his middle initial F, which he had also done for The Dial, the transcendental magazine, The Dial, which Scholars mistakenly have believed also was Margaret Fuller. It was not. That was Matthew. And, um, I, you know, I know that how skeptics look at this stuff, but they refuse to get into the depth of it and see that I'm not just pulling this stuff out of the air. See, they, they want to believe. It's comfortable for them to believe that I'm pulling this stuff out of the air, but they refuse to get into the depth of this study to see that I'm not pulling it out of the air because they're very much more comfortable with the idea that I am. Okay, so the skeptics don't have any idea what they're talking about. So this is written in 48. This is the third year that he had been down in New Orleans writing for the Daily Delta. And this does appear in the Daily Delta. But there's only a couple pieces this year. And I think he got caught and he had to run. There's a long story about that. He apparently had crashed a slave auction and had written a scathing expose about it for the radical Boston Chronotype, which was really the paper that he was attached to at the time. Here, he's pretending to be writing in a very kind of overblown poetic style, humorous poetic style, about a fishing expedition, that a bunch of friends went out of the country and went on a fishing expedition. But it's really a meeting with with the uh, anti-slavery, probably members of the Underground Railroad, in or near New Orleans. These are like deeply embedded people. And Matthew is reporting his contact with these people in this seemingly frivolous article, just as he had done writing as quails for the Boston Weekly Museum, and Quails has been mistakenly attributed by scholars to Ash and Dodge, the entertainer. I've talked about that in recent entries. So this is called Chronicles of the Piscatorian Brotherhood. Piscatorian meaning fishing, or the fishing brotherhood. But it isn't. These are members of the Underground Railroad in the South. And apparently somebody down there in the South wasn't stupid and figured out what this really was. <laughs> and that's why there's only like like two in 1848, two uh, pieces. He says, introduction, editor's delta, as the pleasing task, now note the language that he uses here, because we've, we've seen it in other places that relate to some of these famous uh, claims. As the pleasing task has been assigned me of recording and transmitting to you the sayings and doings of the cordial fraternity, I must enjoin it upon you not to take anything that you may hear find written for granted, 
but rather submit all the matter herein recorded to the test of your own knowledge of the quote genus homo, or else try them by the counsel of experience. Then, if they do not outrage the one or beggar the other, why you may take them as had been written on oath. Which is to say, take this with a grain of salt, it's code. <laughs> that's, that's a long way of saying this is code for, for those in the know. He says, I'm only going to get as far as, as we need to to establish a precedent for the Dr. Spooner here. This order has been created by the italics fraternization of the military with the civil and religious mingos of Baton Rouge and has for its object, as these veritable chronicles will abundantly set forth in the sequel, which never happened, the discovery of the secret of the genuine, quote, free and easy, a secret which has occupied the attention of all the virtuosos, antiquarians, and savants since the ancients first began to write Anno Mundi down to the present time, A.D. 1848. Now he's going to mention uh, one of his uh, pseudonyms, I think, Diogenes, which mostly he signed as D back when he was writing for the New York Constellation. I'm trying to make as many of these cross connections in the tapestry as I can. A comical old burlesque by the name of Diogenes reduced himself to such destitution in the pursuit of this secret, the free and easy, that he could not raise even enough to buy a decent pair of breeches, and so had to stick himself down into an Athenian tub with just his head visible, and he died without ever arriving any nearer a consummation of his wishes than when he trampled on the pride of Plato and told Alexander to get out of his sunshine. He has ever since been considered a famous humbug. And he goes on about the historical people who have searched for the, quote, free and easy. Well, Matthew was a deep philosopher and a deep student of the uh, ancient Greek philosophers. Okay, so here he's, this is like uh, Victor Borgia, you know, who really can play classical music on the piano, but who takes the position of a clown. So that's what Matthew's doing with uh, scholarship. But uh, this search for the free and easy is something that he brought back in Mrs. Partington. So now we're going to go to the carpet bag. I can shut off my Kindle. And we're going to go to the carpet bag for a couple reasons. But first, I just want to show you proof, a smoking gun, that shows that Matthew and Benjamin Penhallow Shillaber were so tight that Matthew actually wrote for one of his characters. Now, uh, the Mrs. Partington character had a few other ancillary characters, including her late husband and her orphaned nephew, whom she took care of. Okay, and he was a juvenile delinquent. And uh, Shillaber thought that it was amusing when he abused animals. Matthew, who was very sensitive to this issue of animal rights, did not think it was humorous. So <laughs> on occasion, Matthew, or at least one occasion, and I think more than one, Matthew would write this character. I know at least two, because one of them is the uh, biography of Mrs. Partington. And uh, there he has Ike hold a mud turtle underwater for 20 minutes to see how long it could it could live or something. Well, mud turtles can live as long as for a lot longer without breathing, see? So that was a way of compromise on Matthew's part where he had Ike be cruel to animals, but the animal actually didn't suffer, see? Because the animal got the better of him. But in this particular case, he writes Ike Partington's visit to the country. And this is Matthew. We know it's Matthew because he signs with his star. This is February 14, 1852. This is about two years after Margaret Fuller had died. So this is not Margaret Fuller unless she's being channeled by Shillaber or somebody. See? So this, I mean, this is Matthew. This was Matthew's pseudonym way before Margaret Fuller claimed it. We're talking like, you know, 15 years before Margaret Fuller claimed it. That was Matthew's pseudonym, which I can prove. So here he's signing with his star. That means that this is Matthew Franklin Whittier, not Benjamin Penhallow Shillaber, who was writing a story about Ike Partington visiting the country. This also comes, and I forgot to get the date. Maybe I'll put it up on the screen. 
I found a brief newspaper article many years ago, which talks about a fire in the Sawyer Grocery on the corner of Congress and Pearl Streets here in Portland, where I am now, where Matthew's flat was burned. And he's probably on the second story of this building and his flat was burned. They say that most of his furniture was got out and, uh, um, you know, he had no insurance and so on. Well, this was during a period when, according to his biographer, he was supposed to still be married to Jane Vaughn. He wasn't married. He was he had split with her officially in 1849, like three years earlier. He maintained a flat in Portland so he could visit his children. And he was writing this very, shall we say, incendiary material, the Trismegistus material that I told you about. I've shared Ensign Stebbings with you recently. Uh, there were people who were very offended by this anti-military satire that Matthew was writing. And I think they burned his flat. I felt that, that as soon as I came across this article about Matthew's flat being burned down, and I think it's like April 52 or something like that. Um, I'll have to check. Immediately I felt, oh, that was arson. And the psychic medium that I had used said that there was a signed copy of Matthew and Abby's version of A Christmas Carol, but it was burned in a fire. That was way, way before I found that he actually had had a fire. <laughs> you see? So this is how all of these different things connect. There's like, you know, if this was if this was connecting the dots, there's some dots missing, you know, but I'm still connecting the ones that are still there. See, are connecting very nicely. You get enough of that and you've got a case. See, if you if I only tell you three dot connections or six dot connections, it looks like I'm just pulling it out of the air. But if I show you 2,300 dot connections, <laughs> that's a different story, right? For that, you have to be interested enough to actually look at them. I publish the books but nobody will read them, see? So everybody assumes that I don't actually have that kind of a tapestry. I do. I have a very complete tapestry now. And over here in the tapestry is The Raven, which Matthew was the original author of, and Edgar Allan Poe falsely claimed. And over here is A Christmas Carol, which Matthew and Abby wrote, began working on not long after their son Joseph had died, see? And over here is the poems that Matthew sent to Elizabeth Barrett Browning. But... Those aren't the only dots I've got. I mean, the whole thing is vast at this point, and it's all interconnected. Anyway, this is Ike Partington's visit to the country. I think that during this period, Matthew was being threatened, and I have another reason to think that, because, um, because Abby was coming to him in spirit dreams, and I have a record of that in this same edition. She was coming to him in spirit dreams and warning him. Okay, and I did find the dream here on the last page of this edition, which is the February 14, 1852, is something I've read for you before called Second Visit to Amory Hall. Now, this is the second one. The first visit to Amory Hall talks about the spirit dream he had from Abby. And elsewhere in the museum, I found the dream, and it's a warning dream. So... So Matthew is in trouble. People are after him. He's getting death threats. And he has gone to the country. That's what I think is going on. And uh, while he's in the country, he writes a humorous piece using one of Benjamin Penhallow Shillaber's characters, obviously with Shillaber's permission, signing with his star. This is how all this stuff fits in. So this is called Ike Partington's Visit to the Country. There's no reason to uh, uh, really read this. I'll, I'll just give you the first paragraph. We have purposed for a long time giving our readers an account of Ike's visit to the country late in the fall of the year, which has just laid its bones to rest with the skeletons of departed centuries. So he's, he's saying that it happened last fall. I don't think so. I think he's in the country right now. Ike received an invitation from one of the first cousins, how many first cousins can a man have, of the late Corporal Partington, that's Mrs. Partington's husband, who, as his relic has often remarked, meaning Mrs. Partington, died a great deal too early to spend a few weeks in visiting their, quote, increase, who is about Ike's age. Mrs. Partington fitted her nephew out for the occasion with a new comforter, Boughton, 
and a pair of mittens knit by her own hands, and bidding him, quote, keep away from the water and not get catched in the bushes by the hair like Nabsalom, dispatched the wayward boy to the care of her husband's cousin, Mr. Increase Robinson, farmer who lives about 50 miles away from the city. So Ike Partington gets in all kinds of trouble, uh, but he doesn't hurt any animals in Matthew's version. Now, another thing I've said is that Matthew would write as many as eight pieces under different pseudonyms for this newspaper, and that it gave me a huge headache trying to sort out his work, meaning rigorously and plausibly trying to sort out his work from other people's work in the paper, because for one thing, they all imitated him. So it was very difficult to figure out, you know, which was his. And, you know, I would I would get fooled and I would then find some reason why that couldn't be Matthews. And I'd get fooled the other way sometimes. I'd have intuitions. Like on the front page of this is a cartoon of a, of a milkman chopping, looks like he's chopping ice. Mr. Sky Blue, the milkman, being scolded one bitter cold morning for tardiness, appeals for sympathy on the score of hardship. He having been compelled that morning to cut through ice two feet thick with a thermometer 10 degrees below zero to replenish his cans. The plea, of course, is admitted in extenuation, and it shows this guy chopping the ice. I think, I feel, I don't think, I feel that Matthew contributed ideas to these kind of one-off cartoons, one-panel cartoons, and that he was kind of in league with the artist who would uh, work with him. But I can't prove it. Very difficult to prove that. And as a result, I mentioned it briefly in my book and kind of went past it. I never tried to nail it down because it's a feeling and there's no place to hook it to, really. Um, the artist here is G.H. Hayes. I never looked up G.H. Hayes. I think there's different ones. I just I have some evidence that Matthew worked with the artists because they caught what he was really talking about. And they wouldn't necessarily have unless he was in league with them. But that's all I can do with that. Now, on the front page, on the right-hand column, is something called Questions. It's written like a letter to the editors of the carpet bag, And it's signed Paul Clifford Brick. I have looked at all the Paul Clifford Brick uh, offerings in this paper, and that's Matthew Franklin Whittier. It's one of his characters, I'm pretty darn sure. Can't absolutely nail it, but I'm pretty sure. He starts out, gents, the felicitous manner in which the immortal Fisher, that's one of his imitators, has answered the queries touching the squaring of yards and the rooster mouth piecing of anchors, emboldens me so far to intrude on his dignified leisure as to propound the following questions. And then he has these silly questions. They, they, he, he also has some questions for Dr. Digg, who is his own character. That's the uh, caricature of uh, academic philosophers. Whether a ship riding by a single anchor goes fast or slow. Whether an anchor watch is of gold, silver, pinchbeck, or tin. Whether the duties of such anchor watch would be better performed if the hands were supplied with an anchor of brandy. Whether the practice of keeping dog watches was not in consequence of building barks, and so on. When he gets down to Dr. Digg, let's see if I can find that one. To the venerable Digg, I propound the following. Whether, when our ships block aided Mexican ports, they did not give, quote, aid and comfort to the country's enemies. I don't understand that one. Whether, when a Russian returns to his country after a foreign tour, his first exclamation is not Russia solve, S-A-L-V-E. I don't understand that one either. See, a lot of these references I don't get anymore. Um, whether ancient pistol was an old piece or not that's capitalized, and I have no idea what ancient pistol is. So this, is, this happens. It's because, first off, I'm not a scholar of the 19th century or earlier centuries, but secondly, that kind of thing is part of the physical personality, Matthew's own associations, his brain, you know, which unless I was under hypnosis and could completely lose my identity or loosen my identity as Stephen Sacalarius and allow my identity as Matthew Franklin Whittier to take over to some extent and start to live again, I wouldn't be able to remember those kind of things. You know, that's why under hypnosis, people suddenly take over the old accent from a past life and they 
you know, maybe can write in that person's handwriting and things like that. But in normal waking consciousness, none of that is there. They don't remember dates. They don't remember particular uh, places and locations and town names and surnames and stuff unless they get under hypnosis. And that's because the um, the use of the current brain kind of gets quieted and loosened and the consciousness is allowed to function without using this brain in this neocortex. That's what I think. Um, Matthew's brain is gone, but the uh, these things are recorded in the higher mind. But I can't access them so long as I am Stephen Sacalarius. I can't access that physical personality of Matthew Franklin Whittier. So I don't know what these references are, but if I was under deep hypnosis, I bet you I would. Now, mo moving to another page here, do we have anything else by Matthew? Well, we have... First of all, a letter here. I've never really paid much attention to this before. It's called Charlie Sacco in New York. S-A-C-O. Around here, that's pronounced Sacco, so I'm assuming that's what it is. It has a brief introduction. Mr. Editors, gents, the enclosed letter was directed to me probably by mistake. I have been unable to find its owner, and as he would undoubtedly see it, if published in the carpet bag, perhaps you will be willing to forward the ends of justice by allowing it to appear in your columns. I remain yours truly, J-E-O, initials. I've never seen Matthew use that before. This is written from New York. I would have to check to see if there's any other evidence that Matthew is in New York at this time. But this is early 1852. There's no reason I know of why he couldn't be in New York in early 1852. Because apparently, well, he got back from his European tour writing as quails for the Boston Weekly Museum, which is not Ash and Dodge, um, mid-October of 1851. And then it's kind of hard to track him down for the next few months. because uh, <laughs> he doesn't write very much as quails. I think there's only two more entries. I think he was really having a major falling out with uh, the editor of that paper. And uh, he was writing more for the carpet bag, but I think he was traveling and working as a freelance reporter, sometimes in Washington, D.C., sometimes in New York City. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if Matthew is in New York City. So then there's the letter. And this is a letter from kind of a country bumpkin in New York City. And this is one of Matthew's favorite themes. He's written this many times, all the way back to Joe Strickland back in 1826. See, and then onward with Enoch Timbertoes was the same thing. And um, there was other ones as well. For the Yankee Doodle, he wrote as Joshua Greening. Same thing, a country bumpkin that's come to New York City and gets scammed a dozen different ways, you know. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if Matthew wrote this letter from Charlie to Bob in New York City. So just very briefly, he says, I'm in New York. I can't hardly believe it, but I'm actually here in the city of fast horses and fast men. Sacco is all very well for townies, but it's cursed slow for men who've seen the elephant. That's one of Matthew's favorite expressions. The uh, series about Joshua Greening was various attempts to see the elephant. That was the name of it. And I have had a view of the animal under the most favorable circumstances. And it goes on like that about his uh, coming to the city. He says, oh, Bob, you never saw anything like it. People don't breakfast till 10 o'clock and take dinner in the middle of the afternoon. It goes on. So I'm pretty sure I'd never seen that before. I just noticed it when I was getting ready here. I think that's Matthew. Moving on to the next page. I don't think there's anything on this, these two pages necessarily, nothing I would definitely claim. And I've always tried to be conservative in claiming work for Matthew, not the other way around. Um, then we have Ike Partington's visit to the country with a star. Immediately above that is a poem called Be Independent by Peter Snooks, Esquire. This was another one of his imitators. And Matthew had written a poem very similar to this called Keep at Work, which was plagiarized by George W. Light. Well, <laughs> I 
think it was quite popular. So here, now what is this guy's name? I may have to put it on the screen because it doesn't come to me right away. Uh, but he went by the pseudonym Peter Snooks, which actually was originally, I think, one of Matthew's silly names. So he actually stole one of Matthew's character names as his pseudonym and went on to steal and imitate. He was fairly decent, you know, at what he was doing, but he wasn't original at all. It was all Matthew's ideas. So that's immediately above Ike Partington's visit to the country. Then the next page has the letter from Spunkville, which I very recently shared with you, signed Trismegistus. That was Matthew, not Benjamin Drew, as uh, Benjamin Penhallow Schillaber strangely said. Immediately above the letter from Spunkville is something that I forgot to point out or didn't think to point out. And it is a poem signed by EFF. I don't know who EFF is. It could be Matthew. It could be somebody else. But it's a love poem. And it really, if it's not written about Abby as a young lady, it certainly would have reminded Matthew of her. So he would have either arranged for this to be immediately on top of a letter from Spunkville, or he would have written it himself. I don't know which. I've never seen him sign his EFF, but I have seen him use one-off pseudonyms that were just, when it related to Abby, or when it was particularly um, very sensitive, he would use completely nonsensical initials. You know, he, I've seen him do it on a few occasions where I can definitely say that's Matthew's work. So it's plausible either way. But I'll read this little poem. Let me get a sip of water. This is going to run long. You know that my first book is 2,280 pages. This is why. People, when they, when they hear that, they imagine that it's like Thomas Aquinas, you know, or uh, I mean, not to put Thomas Aquinas down, I haven't read him that much, but or St. Augustine, and it's a long tome of my own thoughts, you know. It's not. It's so much evidence accumulated over 11 years that all I could do was barely touch on each piece. <laughs> In 2,280 pages, I barely had time to just introduce and draw the connections, you know. <laughs> if I'd really gone into every discovery that I put into the book, it would be, you know, 20,000 pages. So this poem reads, My love dwells not in marble halls. From courtly arts she's free. No vassals wait whene'er she calls, like maids of high degree. Remember that Abby's father was a marquis. She was, by birth, entitled to all that. No costly rings her fingers deck, no gems adorn her hair, but lightly falling down her neck it wantons with the air. Her home is on the mountainside, a shepherd's humble cot, and there she dwells, the hamlet's pride, contented with her lot. Nature ne'er gave a favored child a form more fair to view a voice more sweet, an eye more mild, or heart more kind and true. Like stars of night her bright eyes shine, her laugh rings wild and free, her brightest smile is always mine, her heart beats but for me. No truant shall my heart e'er prove to rove, dear one, from thee, no other maid shall win my love or win a smile from me. That's directly above the letter from Spunkville. Note that we have beautiful singing voice. That was Abby and the stars, you know. Like stars of night, her bright eyes shine. Her laugh wing rings wild and free. If it's not written for Abby, it was certainly something that Matthew said, this is perfect and caused to be put above his satirical letter from Spunkville. <laughs> then on the right-hand side, we have something about spiritualities, about mediumship and, and spiritualism. And uh, Matthew had been a Swedenborgian for many years before he got directly into spiritualism. This is a long, long quote from the biography of Swedenborg, published in 1849, not very long earlier. I would have to guess that Matthew wrote this as well. It's unsigned because it's basically just an introduction to this, uh, an extended quote from this biography. Schillaber officially was a spiritualist by this time because I think Matthew had convinced him by taking him to a seance. As I put it together, what apparently happened is that 
Abby was tapping on Matthew's hat. And then he went to a seance, bringing Shulaber along with him. And the medium, without Matthew having told anybody, presumably, the medium brought Abby through and she said, I'm the one who been who has been tapping on your hat. See, and that convinced Matthew. And it also convinced Shulaber, but he never was deeply convinced, I don't think. So this would have been written by Matthew. There's other people in the paper that were skeptics, so it would almost have to be Matthew. Let's, let's read a little bit of this. Almost every paper that comes to hand contains some allusion to the new, quote, spiritual manifestations, as they are called. A few, here and there, meaning himself, dare avow belief in their spiritual character. Many marvel at the delusion which enthralls sensible men, who tell such wonderful stories of what they have seen and heard. But the most of them denounce the whole of the matter as, quote, humbug, note the word humbug, from A Christmas Carol, without moving from their editorial stools to see for themselves whether it be humbug or not, just like I can't get people to actually read my books. But this word, quote, humbug, has mainly lost its power in the premises, and the spirits, about here at least, will not cease their knocks at its sound. The knocks are as vigorous as ever, and the, quote, manifestations have arrived at a stage where their effects are beginning to be so evident that indifference with regard to them would be worse than blind belief, the denial that I often talk about. People are becoming mad, it is said, through their agency, and yet science turns up its learned nose at them and refuses to investigate. If it be a humbug, as pretended by the why is italicized, the more necessity is there for its exposure and the rescue of the fools italicized that are misled by it. And then he goes on with the quote from the biography of Swedenborg. And that quote starts, Nothing is more evident today than that the men of facts are afraid of a large number of important facts. All the spiritual facts, of which there are plenty in every age, are denounced as superstition. And he goes on. That's Matthew, too. So Matthew has caused that poem to be put above the satirical anti-military letter from Spunkville um, with the poem. And then he has caused this uh, this uh, little editorial on spiritualities to be put in there. And there may be other ones. Um, there's something by Peter Banker about banking in Washington, signed January 27, 1852. If Matthew was freelancing as a reporter in Washington, that could technically be his. Now, the next page, the last page, we have Second Visit to Amory Hall, a poetic peep at the World's Fair, our city reporter, by our city reporter, A. Trunk. A. Trunk is a reference to the, uh, let's see, I think it's the Atlantic and St. Lawrence Railroad that ran out of Portland and very soon was called the uh, Grand Trunk Railroad that identifies Matthew as being from Portland. Um, in the first one, he reports the spirit contact and that night a visitation dream from Abby. <coughs> I've been through that. The second one, he tells us why he writes satire. Let me get just far enough into this to show you. Dear Carpetbag, though little vein of such a wild disjointed strain as that last week I meditated, the nymph of Lurleyburg is glad that she herself was not truncated, as I myself anticipated, but left all lovely, lone and sad, to cool her shins upon the rocks, with voiceless lute and flowing locks. Sorry, I read it so bad. This is a tiny, tiny type. Uh, if I put my light right down here where it's in the screen, I might be able to read it. Well, in the previous one, he was watching this panorama, which is a moving mural like a movie, and he's in the audience, and he's seeing the scenes of the World's Fair, the 1851 London World's Fair, which was held in the Crystal Palace, which he himself attended. But he apparently missed this one statue of the Nymph of Lurleyburg. The Nymph of Lurleyburg was, was a water sprite, a German myth of a water sprite. Matthew would very often call Abby a water sprite. I got a bunch of references for that. Uh, she looked like Abby physically, and it reminded him of Abby when they had lost, just when they had lost their second child. We don't know how that happened. It could have been in a fire when she was like at somebody else's house. And 
Abby became completely struck in shock and died two weeks later. Um, and this statue brought it all back to him because she looked like Abby after their second child had died. And he says that, but he says here in the second visit to Emory Hall, he didn't really expect the editor to print it, see, <laughs> about the spirit contact and, you know, the nymph of Lurleyburg and everything else. Well, I found the nymph of Lurleyburg. I've compared it with Abby and so forth. And so it's actually here in Portland at the uh, Victoria Mansion, there's actually one of the copies of this thing, original copies, you know, bronze. Um, they've got it prominently in display in one of the drawing rooms, you know. Um, I went and saw it. Anyway, after this little introduction where he says that he was surprised that that actually was, was published, he says, and once again, I seized the pen to teach the erring sons of men and drag a mighty knave to view. The reader need not look so blue. I mean not him. I mean not you. <laughs> That's Matthew's whole rationale for writing satirical work, like the uh, Ensign Stebbings from Spunkville. So that was also Matthew. I didn't keep count here. We have, what, five or six or something like that? Um now, there's another one right next to it that looks rather like Matthew, but I don't think it is. This is from the Tuscaloosa, Alabama Monitor. So this is somebody writing in a similar style, but not Matthew. Um, and that's it. There's some advertisements and so on. Now, I may have missed some, but I think we had something like five in there. So that's a little bit of a side trip into the carpet bag. Uh, but what I've demonstrated is Schillaber permitted Matthew Franklin Whittier to write one of his own characters, the uh, nephew of, uh, of Mrs. Partington, Ike, uh, signed with Matthew's star. Okay? So we know that they were tight. And we know that Matthew wrote for Shillaber. There's other examples as well. Now we get and we're getting real tight for time. It's like 54, 40 something. When I, when I announce the time on these things, I, I cut quite a bit out. So it actually ends up being a little shorter than what I announced. This is Partintonian Patchwork, ostensibly by Benjamin Penhallow Schillaber. Now the previous volume, which contained Matthew's work, which was the Life and Sayings of Mrs. Partington, is signed by Schillaber as the editor. And that's because a lot of it was Matthew's work. But by 1873, apparently Matthew had convinced him, just put your name as the author. Matthew was like that. He would, for some reason, he would really hide his light under a bushel. He was much more comfortable, you know, hiding his own authorship, even if it meant that somebody else got the credit. Now, I'm back to fix that because that had some serious problems, you know, because the wrong people would claim credit and, uh, people of low character like Charles Dickens and Edgar Allan Poe and egotists like Margaret Fuller and uh, juvenile liars like uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning would claim his poetry and then people couldn't understand the poetry. Like what I'm trying to say, and this is what really struck me, this epic, silly, humorous poem about Dr. Spooner who is seeking the delectable in my opinion, is really a, a, a brilliant work. You know, it, it really deserves some credit. If you look at copies of this book for sale, I just bought another one yesterday. They're, they run for like $30 or something like that. You can get an antiquarian copy of this. Someday you won't be able to touch it for $30, I'm sure. Um, <coughs> this isn't even mentioned as one of the things that's in the book. You know, the Blifkin's The Martyr series is in there. Those were stories told by Matthew to Shillaber about his unfortunate arranged second marriage. Um, probably written by Shillaber. Some of it was written by Matthew. And uh, that's usually mentioned. But this poem about Dr. Spooner, which is world class, in my opinion, isn't even mentioned where the book is sold. <laughs> it's just assumed to be written by the author that wrote the silly Mrs. Partington. It's assumed to be about as shallow as most of the rest of that. And I, I mean, I hate to call Schillaber shallow, but he wasn't a deep philosopher like Matthew. He was a very nice fellow and kind of on the conservative side and 
you know, apparently long suffering, apparently went through some terrible illnesses with a great deal of fortitude and, you know, many ways an admirable man. But he wasn't the philosopher Matthew was. He didn't understand Matthew. He didn't take Matthew seriously. See, to him, Matthew was kind of a silly joke, but a, a fond joke. He had a fondness for Matthew, but he, you know, kind of condescending, you know. Um, this is this is really, in a sense, it's one of Matthew's life works, which is completely ignored because people don't understand that this deep philosopher actually wrote it. If they understood that this was written by the same person that wrote The Raven and the same person that co-authored A Christmas Carol and the same person that authored most of the pieces that Margaret Fuller, the great transcendentalist, is thought to have written, see, then they would take this a little more seriously. <laughs> I, I don't know what to say, but we're just going to get into it briefly because I'm going to come in pretty close to an hour on this. So first we have the fall biography or the introduction to Dr. Spooner. And this is all tongue-in-cheek. It's written as though it were serious. If you go back to the life and adventures of Dr. Dodamus Duckworth, which was written, it was published either in 33 or 34. It's mistakenly attributed to Asa Green. It's a satire on quack doctors, and it's a fall biography that goes into great depth to sound as though it's a real biography. It's the same author, same technique. If you look into the life and sayings of Mrs. Partington and read the biography of Mrs. Partington, it's the same author. That's Matthew Franklin Whittier with the same technique. So here he is again. Those who have been privileged listeners of Dr. Dionysius Spooner, as he has described to them his adventures while in search of, quote, the delectable, will not be offended at this imperfect rendering of them. He's, he's writing as though this is a known, you know, person, famous person. While others who have not been thus privileged will see in them the struggles of a great mind towards the attainment of an object and may receive from their example and impetus in the right direction, as though it were from the toe of an intellectual boot energetically applied. The writer became acquainted with the doctor through a train of very singular yet natural circumstances, singular from the manner of their occurrence rather than from their character. Passing through the streets one day, he overheard two gentlemen in earnest conversation, one of whom said, well, Dr. Spooner said so, this sentence forced itself upon his mind, and he pondered upon what Dr. Spooner could have said, and who Dr. Spooner was, with no hope of solving the mystery. And he goes on that he finally introduced himself to Dr. Spooner and became known to him, and so on. Uh, then we get into the actual poem. And I'm just going to just get into it. This is very long. This is page 125. This poem goes on to... Page 148. There's no way I'm going to read all of this. I thought about doing it, but it would take a whole hour to read the whole thing. And I think I'd rather just draw some of these connections. The modern syntax. Dr. Spooner in search of the delectable. Now remember, the search of the free and easy that he wrote in 48. On Monday morning, with the sun up wrist, good Dr. Spooner ate his steak in haste and hurried down his coffee and his twist as though no moment he would idly waste then took his cane with his sturdy fist, with animation on his features traced, and started forth in attitude reflectable to seek, mid airs mundane, the goal, delectable. Now there's an asterisk after reflectable, and he says, the author at the outset, before he has led the good doctor through any of the labyrinthine walks of life, with the independence of the poet, who will not be limited by the conventionalities of dictionaries, grammars, or common sense, claims the right to coin as many words as his opinion or the needs of rhyme may require. Hence, the word, quote, reflectable, and the claim is introduced to disarm the critics of the Atlantic, North American, or foreign quarterly, who might snap at this seeming and only fault as a pickerel might at a frog's leg. <laughs> Matthew's disclaimer. I'll just read a couple more stanzas here. Before him lay the undeveloped scene that fate, impatient, waited him to show. He stood a moment with a thoughtful mien, as if uncertain which path he should go, then held his cane, his fingertips between, that, by its falling, he his course might know. Northeast, tis well, now all my doubts at rest, since chance so wills it, I'll go south-southwest. 
Not he alone to go adverse to fate. Some do with all prognostics pointing clear and full success attending at the gate. They do not stop propitious hints to hear, but clutch at phantom shapes that tempting wait, tell to their disappointment and their fear, they see their error and neglected track with little hope of ever getting back. So you see the philosopher underneath the humorous poet. All have desire to win the happy goal and all strike out or some elusive gravel, investing hope and earnestness of soul, the mystery of the future to unravel finding too oft to, to their dismay and dole, their road like Jordan very hard to travel, their delectation like the paddies flee within their grasp and yet not quite to be. Diversity of tastes prompts diverse aims, and as the whim controls, men blindly go it, pursuing here and there their little games, through which, for blessed set out, they think they'll show it, each plays his part with equal hopes and claims, trusting that fate propitious will bestow it. But very few attain the culmination that gives the sought-for boon of delectation. Though, for that matter, comes the question up, what is the boon for which they thus are striving? Fill to the brim joy's most enchanting cup, some would reject it, other drafts contriving. Being more happy far to take a sup from somber springs, a strange anomaly we too often see where happiness is sought in misery. Well, it's a long, long poem. I haven't read it all. I'm in the process of reading it. If I find some smoking gun that screams Matthew Franklin Whittier, and I'm absolutely certain of it, I may come back to this. Um, I think I'm going to enjoy reading this now that I understand and I'm absolutely certain that it's Matthew Franklin Whittier's work. It can be found online, I'm quite sure, at archive.org or the Hathi Trust. Probably either one or both probably have this book. Uh, anyone can look it up and read it. But again, it's effectively hidden from the world because academia and the public in general believed and still believe that the creator of Mrs. Partington wrote it. Therefore, it just can't really be very deep philosophically or all that good, you know. I'm hardly getting any views on this. I mean, you know, who is interested enough to watch me present these things from the past for an hour? I mean, probably nobody gets to the, to the end of these. Nobody would be interested in this. I mean, why should anybody be interested in this if they don't believe me? Only the person that really understands that the reincarnation of the real original author of The Raven and co-author of A Christmas Carol are actually talking to you in real time now, presenting his past life work, which he has discovered, and providing you with objective evidence, having done rigorous research for 11 years. Only the person that really believes that would ever want to sit through one of these. <laughs> I understand that. And not a single person believes me. To a man or woman, there's nobody that really understands that this is absolutely real, and I'm not making it up. I'm, I may occasionally uh, misidentify one of these pieces as Matthew's work, but I'm not wrong about anything else here, you know, <laughs> including the famous ones. Now, I mean, if nobody will take it seriously, if nobody believes me, there's got to be some kind of miracle that will preserve this work for future generations who do believe me. I don't think that I would have been permitted to, to reincarnate, find myself, find Abby, collaborate with her across the Great Divide, amass all this evidence, reconstitute Matthew's legacy, write all these books, collect these physical antiquarian copies and then at the end of this life the whole thing gets put back on ebay my all of my files get deleted and everything is forgotten you know it doesn't make any sense you know i mean i believe over many lifetimes there is justice by the way cosmic justice but there's not i don't think there's that kind of cosmic absurdity <laughs> you know 
<laughs> it could, could be wrong. It could be all about my own karma of my doing this and have nothing to do with actually being understood or believed or accepted, you know, or any kind of a legacy surviving me. It may all be just a matter of me trying, you know, but I don't think so. I think somehow this is going to get preserved. So with that, I will sign off. Uh, whether I do any more of these with only five people watching is a question. I don't know how many people might watch them in the future. So if I feel like something's important, like uh, like this one, I think is important, uh, I may get back on here on the camera. But uh, in general, I'll probably wait until maybe August 1st or so when I announce and start writing people about my paper concerning the raven i put the final <clears throat> i put the final touches on that yesterday i worked on it all day it's 52 pages now i hope knock on wood that the editor of real paranormal magazine will take it at that length fortunately it's an easy uh see no other no other publication would publish that entire 52 page paper as i have written it there's not a scholastic journal in the world that would take that paper you know, so that's why I'm publishing in Real Paranormal Magazine, because they asked me and they cooperate with me. And they'll actually publish it, you know. So it gets published in that first, probably around July 1st. On July 1st, I also will be uh, on one of Matt Frazier's live uh, Zoom sessions. So I'm looking forward to that. I, I don't expect to be picked for a reading because I don't need it. You know, the people that desperately need a reading generally get picked and people like myself who know quite well that there's another side and people are fine over there, they don't get picked. But it's kind of like seeing Daniel Douglas Hume, the physical medium in the 19th century. You just couldn't go through a lifetime in the 19th century and pass up the opportunity to see Daniel Douglas Hume. Uh, do his thing. I mean, this guy, witnesses say that he would levitate. He would levitate up and make a mark on a ceiling, you know, but then on one occasion, he he's up on the second floor, if I understand correctly. He sails out a window in a second floor apartment and sails back in another window. There's no magician in the world that could, could do that, <laughs> I don't think, you know. I mean, you can't pass up the opportunity to have seen him at least once. Well, that's the way I feel about Matt Frazier. I can't, I mean, I can't afford it really, but I can't afford not to have seen him at least once live in action reading people. So uh, my session comes up on the 1st of July and I'm looking forward to that. But round about the 1st of July, my article about Edgar Allan Poe will go live on Real Paranormal Magazine UK, not Real Paranormal Magazine. And then a month from that, I will feel uh, clear to start writing to something like 206 academics. About half of them are Poe experts and introducing that paper. None of them will read it, probably. And uh, then trying to bring it to anybody else's attention that might be interested. It's one heck of an article, but you have to actually read it, you know. Um, Nobody ever got drunk off of a bottle of wine that they just looked at. <laughs> you know? So I will leave it there. And whenever the next time is, I will see you then.